Hello, friends. Welcome to the Genuinely Interested Podcast. I'm your host, Roy Bensvi, and this week we have Felix, or uh, we'll name him Felix. Felix is a former Mossad agent, so we obviously cannot give away his real name. And, you know, he was kind enough to come on the show and talk about what happened with at least one of his operations, which is the most famous one in Arus, which was the Red Sea Resort. They actually smuggled Israeli, not sorry, Israeli. Later they became Israelis, but Ethiopian Jews from Sudan into Israel. And the way they got there and how they worked under the radar of the uh, local police and officials and army and everyone, and miraculously managed to, to go on for about 11 years with, I believe, zero fatalities. So, I mean, it's it's a pretty miraculous story, but the Red Sea Resort part of it, which is obviously the sexiest part, and that's what the movie was, was made about, and that's what the media headlines are always referring to, was, um, according to Felix, the least important. Obviously, the Ethiopian Jews and their story was the, the most important part. And that's something that's unfortunately talked about less often and focused on less often. But that's, you know, media, that's Hollywood, and and, and I get it. It's just apparently not as sexy and not as, uh, it doesn't, it's not a, a headline that grabs you as much as fake Red Sea Resort run by Israeli spies. But regardless, this was an amazing operation, a humanitarian operation. And if you stick to the end of the episode, you'll hear some really funny stories about some of the things that happened. And maybe in the future, Felix will be kind enough to come back on the podcast and uh, give us some more stories because, uh, like, according to him, he has, and I'm sure he does, a lot, a lot of stories from less six years in the field. So... Again, I had a great time on the podcast. It was interesting. It was definitely a little bit different than the usual podcast. So I think you guys will definitely enjoy this. As always, subscribe, rate, review. It helps. It really does. At the end of the day, uh, it gives the, the show a little bit of a bump on iTunes, on Spotify, and Google, etc. So all these things help. So without further ado... I hope you enjoy this week's episode with Felix. The Genuinely Interested Podcast. Hey, uh, Felix, how you doing? Doing great, thank you. How are you doing? Good, thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I've been wanting to talk with someone about this topic for a while so i'm glad i could find you and uh reach out it wasn't easy but you know we, we got it done yeah we make it our business to make it not easy <laughs> i can i could see why so yeah so you know we're gonna call you felix and uh you were part of the mission in the red sea resort and for people that don't know in the, I think it's late 70s, early 80s, uh, the Mossad ran an operation in Sudan, smuggling uh, Jews from Ethiopia through Sudan and into Israel. And the whole time they ran uh, a fake diving resort, which actually op operated as a real diving resort. And they, you know, they were bringing tourists from all over the world. But in the whole time, in this whole time, the plan was actually bringing the Jews over. So what was uh, your role in, in, uh, in this operation? And just to get things a little more correct, uh, the, the Red Sea Diving Resort, the village, was called Arus, by the way. Yeah. And it wasn't it wasn't instrumental at all in uh, in arresting the Ethiopian Jews. It was simply a cover story, no more, no less. Mm -hmm. And Netflix, the Netflix movie about it, and other things that have been written about it, put it in the center of things. But the Red Sea, the diving village, was just a cover story. That's it. We operated in Sudan for 11 years, from the beginning of 1979 to the beginning of 1990, out of which we had the diving village for just slightly over four years. So actually, we operated in Sudan more time without the village than with the village. And to make it even clearer, we did not smuggle one Jew, one Ethiopian Jew 
through the village. The village was just a cover story, and that's it, period, just to make it clear. Over the 11 years of our work in Sudan, there were three commanders in the field. The first one was Dani Limo. He went down there at the end of 1978, beginning of 19, 1979. I joined the team in 1982, and I became commander in 1983, and I was in charge till 1988. In 1988, another guy came in, and he was in charge till 1990 for the last two years. So that's, that's where I fit in the story. So between what the media portrays and what the movie shows and what the reality was, there's a huge gap you're saying. Yeah, the movie is a typical Hollywood movie. Even yeah. though we made the point of bringing the uh, scriptwriter and the producer to Israel, they sat here for a whole week. They met uh, all sorts of people who took part in the operation, Navy SEALs, Her- Hercules pilots, uh, Mossad operators an ex-head of Mossad, we gave them everything on a golden platter so that they would make the movie as close as possible to reality, but they did not. (laughs) Being Hollywood, they did what they thought would sell more tickets. So the movie is very, very far from the truth. But it's, you know, it's okay. I mean, if the movie uh, made people think a bit more positively about Israel, then maybe it did something positive as well. Yeah. Did you like it, the movie? (laughs) Not, not particularly. No, there, it wasn't. <laughs> first of all, it wasn't. It wasn't balanced at all. They showed uh, naval operations and not not one aerial operation. The only Hercules landing in the movie is the CIA Hercules, and in reality, the Air Force did much, much more work in Sudan than the Navy did. I mean, like maybe tenfold more Jews were taken out by Hercules aircraft than by uh, by naval seal operations. So it was out of proportion. And again, it put the diving village in the center of of the picture, which it was not. I mean, I think recently, in recent years, there's been this fascination in in Hollywood with Mossad missions, right? You have uh, the spy with with Eli Cohen and the capture of Eichmann and Ashraf Mawan and the Red Sea and and other movies and documentaries and really kind of popped up over the last few years, um, capturing, I think, kind of the, the imagination of, of Hollywood and the viewers, you know, why, uh, you know, do you have an opinion on maybe why that is? Uh, everyone likes to know about, uh, seek. everybody likes to know secrets, first of all. Yeah. The average person in the street would love to, to know things about, about stuff that he's usually not supposed to know about. Usually everything that's secret operation like Mossad, CIA, FBI, whatever, Even old files from the Second World War that are coming out now make fascinating reading, like the spies in the, uh, all the cover up and the double cross towards the uh, landing in Normandy. So, you know, people like to know about these secret things. It always, it sells well and it uh, raises curiosity and uh, I guess good rating as well, whatever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and Hollywood and the media, they always, like you said, they'll take one part of it and make it much more than what it was because that's what sells and that's what's dramatic and they'll make it into this whole thing. Yeah, so they're good at dramatizing it. Yeah, in our case, in our case, the diving village is very sexy. You know, it's good for yeah. making movies about, it's a sexy story. But in reality, as I said, it was just a cover story, no more, no less. We did more operations without the village than we did with the village as a cover story. We had other cover stories, so no big deal. Anyway, it's but, sexy, it sells nicely. That's why it became kind of the center of the Hollywood movie. Or Rafi Berg, the British guy, just issued a, a book called uh, The Red Sea Spies. It's not the word Ethiopian doesn't even appear on the cover of the book. So again, he put the diving village in the center of things, which it is not. But, you know, it yeah. sells better, so I guess. Yeah, I mean, but it it was a a part of it. Like, so I mean, there was an idea of of the cover story, right? Like the, the that place was abandoned by I think Italian entrepreneurs, and was a cluster of like fifteen red roof bungalows, kitchen, large dining room. They had everything. I don't know if you had running water or not, but you know, it was a it was a nice kind of like secluded area. Um, I mean, how much I guess work did you guys have to put into it to make it a, a functioning hotel? Actually, quite a lot of work. When it was discovered, it was discovered not because we were looking for a diving village, 
Danny Lemore, the first commander, was there with an ex-Navy SEAL looking for landing beaches, and they ran into it just by chance. And they asked the watchman, there was a watchman there, it was, de- it was deserted, there was just a watchman, they asked him, who does it belong to? Somehow they managed to get to the Sudanese International Tourist Corporation, whom it belonged to, but it, w- it had been deserted for seven years when they ran into it. And they asked if they could lease it, and they said, it's a good cover story, it gives us a cover story, why we go into Sudan at all, because white people, Caucasians, didn't have a good reason to travel to Sudan, nobody has, so this would give yeah. them a good reason to travel to Sudan. And a good reason to be knocking around the beach because, you know, everybody was thinking of, of naval operations to begin with. And this gives you a good cover story why we're roaming around on the beach. So that's that's how they came upon it. And that's how it happened. It was really just by chance. And there was quite a lot of work to be put into it. And we flew in some stuff with CH-130s, like uh, there are 30, 30 guest rooms there, 30 double rooms. So we flew in 30 air conditioners on a C-130, one of the operations, Israeli-made, but with different labels on them. We changed the labels. We flew in a desalination plant. We made our own, uh, we made 5,000 gallons of fresh water daily from the wow. sea. And uh, yeah, and diving equipment and a lot of stuff. We did quite a lot of work to bring it back to be a functioning village. And it was fully functional. It was It was beautiful. It was paradise. I mean that's that's what like at least probably a year's work, right? It's a lot of work. Yeah, for the first work, our agreement with the Sudanese government was we don't pay them rent for the first year because we're renovating it out of pocket, so we didn't pay them any rent, and only the second and uh, second year onwards we started paying rent for it or lease lease money. And I mean, in order to make the resort legit, you had to promote it, right? You had to bring people, you had to bring tourists from all over the world. I read that there was a point where you guys actually had too much business. There were too many people coming in. Yeah, what happened was uh, we we did advertise it. We printed beautiful, glossy brochures and put them in in, uh, travel agencies around Europe who specialize in diving. There There are specific travel agencies that specialize in diving. So we put them, so if you would walk into a, a diving uh, tourist uh, office in Europe at the time, on the rack next to Papua New Guinea and uh, the Great Barrier Reef and Fiji, whatever, you'd find the brochure of our village in Sudan. And uh, people, especially veteran divers who knew that Sudan, you know, Costo, Hansas, all those uh, pioneers of sports diving, of scuba diving, they wrote that Sudan is one of the most beautiful places on earth, but there was no running operation there. By the way, that's why the Italians decided to build it there, but they ran out of money and they left it. So people started finding these brochures and started booking. We had an office, a working office in Geneva. They started booking, uh, and the office in Geneva put together groups and sent them to Sudan. What happened later on was that the uh, diplomatic corps in Khartoum discovered this place. Because, you know, if you serve in an embassy, let's say in Brussels, then on the weekend you hop into your car and you drive for two weeks, you're in Paris or in Amsterdam or wherever. If you serve in Khartoum, you can only commit suicide on the weekend. That's about the most exciting thing you can do <laughs> because there's nowhere to go. And suddenly these yeah. people heard that there's this diving village and they started coming down. So the American ambassador would come down with his family, bodyguards, whatever, take a long weekend, like from Wednesday to Tuesday, <laughs> and then have fun. And then some of the richer Arabs from uh, Port Sudan used to come up as well. So the village became very busy towards its, the end of its life. Yep. And I mean, generally, how was the vibe there? Was it actually fun? I mean, it was supposed to be a, a tourist getaway, right? So, I mean, did you guys actually have fun there? First of all, the diving was superb. And uh, there was a lady running the village. There were three ladies, actually, who took turns every couple of months. They rotated. We, put, we wanted the lady to run the village because it looks more legit, you know, less less suspicious. Mm-hmm. So there was a lady running it, and there was an in-house resident diving instructor, also a Mossad guy, who was there all the time just for, you know, for chance people would come in so there would be a diving instructor. And the rest of the team, the rest of the crew were locals who worked there. And, uh, and they would give a good time, of course. There was a video room with a big selection of videos so people could watch movies at night. There was alcohol which is not something that's common in Sudan. It's a Muslim country, so we had a full stock a full stock bar with beer and lots sorts of liquor. We used to bring ourselves when we flew into Sudan and bought in duty-free. 
in Europe, we used to bring in some stuff and, uh, and you could get it locally, like, you know, not very legally, but you could get it. So there was alcohol, there was video, there was music. We had parties there. It was a, it was a fun place. Beautiful, beautiful. And it was a little corner of paradise, really very special. Yeah, I'm assuming but you're, that you you you're luring me again into the diving village as if the, this is the center of the whole story. <laughs> no, no, don't worry. We'll we'll, we'll touch it. We'll touch everything. It's just uh, you know, it, it is an interesting part. You know, it's a very, it's a it's a great ruse. It's not something that really happens often, right? This is not something that usually happens in order to get, you know, refugees or to get Jews from A to B. And uh, so it's an interesting story. I know it's not the main part of it but it's still interesting so you know we can touch upon that a little bit and then afterwards we'll get into obviously you know the more important stuff um i guess how how long were you in in sudan for you specifically when i joined in 1982 and i ended my job my tenure in 1988 so Almost six years, but on and off, because uh, I run yeah. the operation in Israel as well, the department in the Mossad. So I had to come here and go back. So I, I was, you know, in and out, in and out for almost six years. And I mean, and, and how many, at any given time, how many uh, Mossad agents were you there at the at Arus? Well, uh, the diving village, as I said, was operated uh, regularly by one uh, lady was a Mudira. In Arabic, Mudira is a manageress and one diving instructor. That's the minimum that was there all the time, 24-7. Yeah. Towards an operation, whether naval or area operation, we would uh, come in another four, five, six uh, Mossad guys to run, to run the actual operation, to drive the trucks, to land the aircraft, to do all the stuff. And also, when we knew there were more tourists coming, we would fly in uh, one or two more diving instructors so they could handle the uh, a larger number of tourists, because if the village, village is fully booked, like uh, we had 30 double rooms, so it could be 60 people. So to handle 60 people, one diving instructor cannot do it. So if we knew there were many divers coming, we would fly in one or two more diving instructors, uh, so-called diving instructors, to handle the tourists. And I mean, when in, you in guys... Addition to that, the local, in addition to that, we had the local stuff, you know, the chambermaids, the cook, the waiter, the... A generator operator, the compressor operator, the gardener, whatever. So we had the watchman. We had about 13 or 14 uh, local guys, Sudanese guys, working for us uh, without having any idea that this was a non-legit operation. They were just, you know, they were on our payroll and they were working for, for these uh, foreigners running the diving village. And were you guys always in character? I mean, when you were, let's say... Just the two of you in a room, you know, would you would you speak Hebrew or, or call each other by, by your names or is it always in character? No, no, no. We've always uh, called each other by our uh, cover names. Each one had his own uh, foreign passport and we spoke uh, mainly English. Uh, if two of the people were, you know, naturally or French speaking from home, so they would maybe lapse into a French conversation between them, which is okay. But to know Hebrew, the only time we would speak Hebrew or go and you know go go of you know go a little wild to say we would if we were in a, on his in a zodiac far away without tourists out in the open sea we could speak Hebrew, or if we're driving a vehicle in the desert just um, by ourselves we could speak Hebrew. But other than that, we spoke uh, only only according to the passport we had and the names that we had on our passports. I mean, does it get confusing? Is it hard? I mean, you're all, you know, it's almost like you're playing in a movie, but you never go off set. It's just playing in a movie for months or years at a time. And I mean, you have your own personality and you have your own identity that you grew up with. And all of a sudden there's this whole different person you have to become. Doesn't it, isn't the, the, the lines, doesn't, don't they get blurred a little bit? <laughs> I have it, I ran it. I, I, I worked in a Mossad on different operations, not only this one. And I made a habit of when I woke up in the morning, before opening my eyes, I would think quietly, where am I? What operation is this? What's my name? Where am I from? And only after that, after I sorted all these out with myself, I would, you know, get out of bed and start my day. So, yes, it can be confusing, but, you know, you learn to live with it and you learn to do it in an organized way, methodical, so it's okay. And I'm assuming you go through 
through training to have to deal with that, right? Yeah. Extent, yeah. Extensive training. Yes. Definitely, yes. But, you know, probably we'll skip to the next question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, at that time, Ethiopians were fleeing uh, Ethiopia due to, uh, I believe it was famine. They had environmental issues, political reasons. There was a lot of turmoil. Um, you know, at what point did, did the government realize that there are Jewish people in Ethiopia and we need to, to bring them to Israel? And why couldn't, you know, why did we have to do this whole Red Sea Resort um, cover story? Couldn't um, the government of Israel just fly planes into Ethiopia and bring them up from, from there? No, well, first of all, this is a long story, but uh, I don't know. I'll try and make it a little short. By the way, we, we, we have time. Have you can tell it as long as you want. So the the Jewish the Ethiopian Jewish uh, community was has been in Ethiopia. It's by the way the longest continuous Jewish community in one place in the whole world. These people were there from the days of the first temple, like around eight hundred seven hundred BC, and they always dreamt of coming back to Jerusalem. And when the state of Israel was born in nineteen forty eight. We have the law of return, which says every Jew in the world is entitled to come to the state of Israel, and the state of Israel will do its utmost to make this possible. But uh, the uh, rabbinate or the, the Orthodox Jewish uh, bodies would not uh, accept these people as Jews. And it took about 25 years, till 1973, until finally they would be accepted as Jews. So this explains why no Ethiopian Jews except for a handful, uh, came to Israel before uh, 1973. In 1973, when the rabbi uh, Ovadia Yosef decided they're Jewish enough, then the haggling started in this country, in our country. Uh, who's going to finance it and this? And they know bureaucracy is bullshit, excuse me for the expression, BS. You can delete the bullshit and leave the BS. Bullshit <laughs> is fine, don't and, worry about it. Uh, and eventually, uh, because they were accepted as Jews, and they said, okay, we can bring them to, to Israel. But what happened at that time was in 1973, when uh, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef declared them as Jews, the, the emperor or the guy in control of Ethiopia was Haile Selassie. And he sees himself as a descendant of King Solomon and Queen of Sheba. He was, at the time, a great friend of Israel. He said, no problem. But in Israel, it took about a year till they got things, got the act together. And by the time they did that, there was a military coup in Ethiopia. And the guy who came into power was called Menegistu Haile Mariam, a devout communist, friend of the Russians, friend of the Arabs, not a friend of Israel, the one in an understatement, hated our guts. And he said, no Jew will be allowed from uh, Ethiopia to the Zionistic entity. So this answers the question why we didn't fly them out of Ethiopia, because there was a, le a leader there, a ruler there, would not allow. Okay, that's very simple. Yeah. Now, in 1973-74, refugees, Ethiopian refugees, started fleeing Ethiopia into Sudan because of the civil war in Ethiopia. Now, no Jews joined this movement because they knew that uh, that Sudan is a Muslim country, and if they knew they would find out they're Jews, they would kill them. So at the beginning, there were no Jews taking part in this at, at all. Until one guy called Ferede made his way into Sudan, didn't tell anyone he was a Jew, and made contact through a letter through the Red Cross in Geneva, sent a message to Israel saying, I'm in, I'm in Sudan, send me an airline ticket, I want to come. Instead of an airline ticket, they sent Danny Limor down to meet him, and that's how the whole operation started. And once Danny Limor... Uh, decided that he thinks that uh, Ethiopian Jews can be taken out through Sudan, then Ferede sent a message into Ethiopia for Ethiopian Jews to start making the trek into Sudan together with the other non-Jewish refugees. So that's how they started going. Only when they got a, a, a message calling them, initiated by the Mossad, calling them to start the trek from Ethiopia to Sudan. None of them until then had made the trek. So this is to make the point clear about why we didn't simply fly them out of Ethiopia, and also why it took so long. So now we have the answer to all those questions. 
And how did they they make the journey from Ethiopia to Arus? Was it all by foot, or there was uh, maybe points with transport that you guys would help them? You know, how was that process? Not Arus, not not Arus, nothing to do with Arus. Sudan, no. not Arus. Okay. You said from Ethiopia to Arus, no, to Sudan. No, we didn't. We had nothing to do with it. There were uh, guides, yeah, who were actually uh, smugglers who received quite a lot of money from the the uh, refugees. Non-Jews and Jews alike, they would pay them quite a lot of money. They would walk by night, hide by day, because the Ethiopian ruler uh, declared the death penalty for anyone trying to leave the country. So they walk by night and and hide by day. And the trek depends on where in Ethiopia they started off, would take between two weeks, three weeks, up to two, three, four months. Uh, very tough, very difficult with, uh, you know, animals on the way and uh, robbers and... Uh, it was a very traumatic experience. There were very, some very, very uh, traumatic and heavy stories uh, told by the uh, survivors of that trip. So that's how it was done, all with uh, these smugglers, you know, acting as guides. And then they would bring them into refugee camps and set them free. And then our operators, we had, uh, we recruited from the young Ethiopians that started arriving. We recruited helpers that helped us inside the refugee camps. Because we as Caucasians had no business being in the refugee camps, we would stand out like a, like a lighthouse. So we we used these the team of uh, of helpers that worked for us inside the refugee camps. These were all young Ethiopian Jews who took huge risks. They made unbelievable made an unbelievable job of it, and without them, we wouldn't have managed to rescue probably even one Jew. Yeah, so that was my next question. The the local connect you had, Ferde, which I think he had a, from what I, I understand, a really good relationship with uh, Danny Limo. And how instrumental, you know, was his role in in helping you guys throughout throughout the years? As I said, we had no business being ourselves in refugee camps. So Ferde was the one at the beginning, <clears throat> would roam around the refugee camps looking for the Jews arriving from uh, from Ethiopia. And later on, he uh, recruited younger guys that joined him as helpers. He left Sudan about a year later because, you know, the Sudanese authority were all the time snooping around trying to find out. And because his name became known to someone because of some roadblock somewhere, so we, we flew him out on one of the operations, and then he was taken over by other other young Ethiopians who did the job. At any given time, there were six or seven or eight of them inside the camps who did the fantastic job for us. And I mean, what was that feeling like every time you would, you know, help save hundreds or, or tens or thousands, whatever the numbers were each time? You know, that must have been a pretty amazing feeling, no? Yes, it was. It's a very this whole operation is a very non typical Mossad operation. You know, the Mossad, like any other secret operation, is busy busy with uh, killing, stealing, uh, copying, uh, whatever. Mm-hmm. And this is a this is a very humane kind of operation. It's saving people. Yeah. And if you look at uh, other secret uh, <laughs> spy organizations, they they're not there to save people. They, if if they do something, it's usually the other way around. Yeah. But uh, yeah. this was very non typical of a Mossad operation, and uh, the feeling shared by everyone who took part. Our guys on the ground, the Hercules pilots in the air, the naval seals, everyone who was involved. It was an incre- a very, it was an incredible feeling. You see these people like they came out of the Bible, and suddenly they're fulfilling their twenty seven hundred year dream of coming back to Jerusalem. It was amazing, and the numbers varied. It could be a handful of five or six uh, smuggled from Khartoum, from uh, from Gedarif, where the refugee camps were, to Khartoum. And then with false papers or false passports or Sudanese bribed passports would get on a civilian airline, fly to Europe, and from there fly to Israel. So they were that was done by handfuls. And uh, the larger numbers were taken out by ship. Uh, the biggest shipload that came to Israel was 350 people, but the ship would run even for 25 people. It all depended on how many Jews we had in the camps at the time. And then we started with C-130s, so the numbers started at 160 per aircraft. I went all the way up to uh, an operation with three aircraft landing at the same night, taking out uh, more than 400 uh, Jews. 
So yes, the numbers varied, and the feeling was always the same. It was an incredible, incredible, uh, very touching, very special, very special feeling. Big privilege, big privilege, huge privilege. We were really, really lucky to be born at the right time, you know, the right place to take part in such an amazing uh, saga. Yeah, and I mean logistically, I mean I, I I don't know exactly what you were in charge of, but I think this was part of it. I mean this was no easy feat, you know, getting at uh, obviously thousands overall, but hundreds at a time or tens at a time from Ethiopia to Khartoum, then to not Arus, but, you know, the area where they would pick them up from, getting boats, getting planes, uh, army, navy. There's just so much lo- logistics that go into this. And, you know, and, and, and I believe no one was hurt in the process as well. Like there was no, no one got shot, no one got killed. That's, that's quite the, that's a pretty amazing feat for, for you, for, you know, to, to do that. You know, the believers among us, we didn't have many, but the believers among us said that uh, someone was watching us from above because of the nature of the work we were doing. Yeah. But the truth is, we were, first of all, we were, we were professional. We tried to be as professional as we could. And also, uh, we were lucky. Luck is a big part in these operations. We were very lucky. We took lots of risks. We, you know, we rounded lots of corners. We did a lot of things that weren't allowed by the book, but we took the risks. And we were really very, very, very lucky at the end of the day. And uh, apart from some road accidents, we, we were shot at once on the beach. And we were shot at once on the road. But uh, luckily, the Sudanese are not uh, that such good shots. So uh, <laughs> nobody was hurt, eventually, at the end of the day. So we really, uh, if you think about it, I don't think there's a precedent. One of, our, one of the heads of the Mossad said once in one of our meetings, he said there's probably no precedent in the world ever of a, an intelligence organization such as the Mossad working in deep undercover in an enemy country for 11 years. And it's not like sitting in your second story room and looking out of the window and seeing if a tank passes underneath and sending off a coded message. No, this is doing actual operations. It's meeting, smuggling people down to the beach, meeting Navy SEALs there taking people into the desert, finding a landing strip, marking it and landing C-130s. We were doing crazy things there for 11 years solid, which is really crazy. Probably unprecedented, probably. Oh, definitely unprecedented. I mean, can you, you mentioned a little bit earlier that there was a shooting uh, at, at night. Um, can, you, can you tell that story? I think they, they did it in the film. I don't know if, again, I don't know how accurate it is, but, you know, there's that part where, uh, the Sudanese captain, he's shooting, he's screaming, and then Danny screams back at him, and he's saying, oh, these are guests, and, and what and whatnot. Like, how how did that actually go down? Well, what happened was, it was in Danny's time, not my time, I can tell you the story. Uh, basically, the Sudanese security forces were looking for smugglers who were smuggling, who were kidnapping young, uh, like, teenagers or young, you know, 10-year-old, 11-year-old girls and smuggling them into Saudi Arabia across the Red Sea to be sex uh, sex slaves in the uh, Saudi sheikh's harems. And the uh, United Nations heard about this, and they asked the Sudanese to try and stop it. So the Sudanese security were looking for these smugglers. And they saw this convoy driving along the coast, so they followed it, thinking that they'd catch these smugglers. But uh, it was Danny and his team of uh, Mossad guys with some Toyota jeeps and uh, pickups with uh, Ethiopian Jews behind in the back, in the you know back covered with the canvas, and uh, as they were putting the people on the boats on the beach, there was a guy as a lookout on one of the hills uh, just to see if you know the navy comes or police or whatever, and he suddenly sees people you know walking around in uniform and with weapons, and he, he radios down to say that we have company. So they sped sped up the operation on the beach, and the Sudanese guy took initiative, stormed the beach with his, it was a whole platoon, and the commander fired off a whole, uh, his whole magazine of uh, AK-47, a Kalachnikov rifle, and luckily he didn't hit anyone. And then he ran and tried, pushed his, pushed the barrel sideways, and they ended up uh, grappling in the sand. And the end of the day, they didn't see anything. They thought they saw boats. And you understand, what were the boats? He said, I don't know, I have no idea. And he started shouting at the officer and he said, uh, give me your name. I'll see it. You'll be demoted. We're trying to uh, to uh, 
develop tourism here and you come shooting at night, you could have killed a tourist, international incident, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And they launched a complaint with the commander of the Red Sea uh, uh, Sudanese command. And uh, we got, uh, actually, then he got uh, an apology, apology letter. <laughs> uh, the guy apologized, the general apologized, said, look, we didn't know, we're sorry, we probably won't we, we see that it doesn't happen again. So it ended up okay. And the fact is that uh, we went on to do uh, about six more naval operations after that one. No, five more naval operations after that uh, shooting incident. So apparently it, uh, it, it ended okay. Yeah. There was another funny story that had nothing to do with the sea. Uh, we said, I uh, told you that we also smuggled uh, Jews through Khartoum, through civilian airlines. So a guy was driving uh, with a load of Jews on the back of his pickup, was stopped at a roadblock, and he decided to run the block, the roadblock, and he stormed through it. And the guy at the roadblock fired the whole magazine after him also, AK-47. Luckily, he missed. And the car disappeared into the into the night, and it was a red-colored car. And surprisingly, the Sudanese got down the number plate for some reason or other, mm-hmm. which is beyond what you know, beyond the compatibility of the Sudanese <laughs> police. And a few months after that, by a sheer chance, another one of our people was driving the same car through the same roadblock, but without Jews in the back at the time. And they stop him and say, come here, you're under arrest. He said, what did I do? You know, he started shouting. You always shout. It's always good. Yeah. Show confidence and shout. And they said, uh, sit down. Sit down. Don't move. You have to bring someone. And they go and bring the guy who shot at the pickup that night. And they said, here, this is a car you shot at. He said, he walks around it, the soldier, and he said, this is not that car. He said, look, it's the same car, the same number plate. He said, no, 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 no. The car that I shot at is full of bullet holes. This one has no bullet holes, so it's not the car that I shot at. And they released our guy with the car, and he drove off. That was it. <laughs> so because of the uh, ego of the Sudanese policeman or soldier, yeah. because it cannot be that he fired a whole magazine and there were no bullet holes in the car, so the guy got off with it. So those are the two shooting incidents we had in Sudan over the years. I almost feel like it was lucky that this was happening through Sudan in a way. I think a lot of the stuff that, I mean, I guess this was also a different time, you know, and nowadays things are very different, but I think a lot of the stuff you guys were doing there, you probably couldn't have done it in many other countries, right? First of all, things were done in other countries as well, I can tell you, uh, but they never got famous because they never had a, an Operation Moses attached to them or Operation uh, uh, Solomon attached to them. Had had there not been an Operation Moses, which became known worldwide, a lot of this stuff wouldn't be wouldn't be you know we wouldn't be talking about it yeah, today. Yeah. But because Operation Moses made the whole thing opened up the whole thing to the press, so the rest of it became you know public domain as well. But there have been things done other places, you know, different methods, different ways. The answer is wherever we want to, we can we can do it. We can do it. Things get more complicated today with all the cell phones and everything, but. Uh, Everybody has to work. You know, it's a game of chess. They change their methods. We change our methods. At the end of the day, we have to do the job. We do the job. Do you think there's, are there operations that you think they'll be like declassified in two or three decades that will just blow people's minds? I don't know if they will be declassified, but if you ask if there are other operations, the answer is yes. Have been and are and yes, and there always will be. Always will be. There are, I'm telling you again, the only reason this thing was, was open to the public is probably because of Operation Moses that became public uh, knowledge and because of Operation Solomon. Had they not happened, I don't know when this would have been declassified. I have no idea. I really don't know. Yeah. None of my decision, not my, no, not my department. So at the time when uh, when the um, Ethiopian Jews were coming through, did, there was there some sort of a vetting process? I mean, how do you know, you know, if if they're all Jews, if there's maybe some insurgents that are coming with them? You know, was there some sort of a process? We had we personally, the Caucasians running the operation, the Israelis, we had no idea whatsoever. Mm-hmm. That was part of the job of the the Ethiopian youngsters who kept working for us, who did the office, the work for us inside the refugee camps. 
They were in charge of finding out that all the people they bring to our meeting point, where we used to pick them up and take them all to the sea or to the landing strip, that everyone that they bring with them uh, is a Jew. That was their job and solely their job. We had no uh, no way of knowing and no uh, and we, we never dealt with it. It wasn't, wasn't any of our business. But over the years, uh, there were very, 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 very few exceptions. And the exceptions might be uh, like the following one. For example, a Jewish family in Ethiopia that's more well-to-do, they had a nanny, okay, who looked after the kids. And then one night, the, the Jews in the village organized and say we're going to Sudan. So they take the nanny with them because she has to look after the kids. It makes sense, doesn't it? Like a rich family uh, going on holiday, they take the nanny with them. So they took the nanny so she could take after the, look after the kids on the way. And they got to the refugee camps, and the nanny kept on looking after the kids. And then one night, these young people came and said, okay, psh, we're leaving tonight. So they picked up everyone, including the nanny, who was part of the family. They didn't, you know, go that deep. So, but it happened very seldom. So from time to time, a nanny like this or a servant would arrive in Israel and say, oops, you know, I'm not Jewish. So we would help them, send them off to Canada or wherever, or maybe convert them to Judaism if they wanted to. But uh, very, 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 very few uh, few times it happened. Very few. Almost insignificant. Yeah. But I mean, so on a, on a kind of daily basis, I mean, you're there for X amount of years. Uh, you said six years in, in total, I think. Um, how do you how do you deal? You're in a you're, you're in a foreign country, hostile country, uh, with it, it's not like you're next door. I mean, if something goes wrong, it's no man's land. You're basically you, you're fending for yourself, and there's not much you can do. How do you deal with that constant pressure? I mean, does it build up and just become more and more over time, or over what over I don't know, or a period of time does it just become mundane, just become normal, and you just kind of forget about it? You don't forget about it, but it does, you know, if you're talking about the graph, the graph straight flattens out at the end, but it's not like it's different than when you, it's a flat, it's a flat graph, but it's a much higher level of stress or of uh, alertness than the same flat graph that's running when I'm here at home. Mm -hmm. So of course it's different. You go down there, you raise your conscience level and, and uh, preparedness and care and everything, you raise them two steps or three steps, whatever. But then once you're there, it's a, it, it does become a routine. But as I say, it's not the same routine as here. When you say routine, I don't want you to think that we'd, uh, you know, not continue to be on our toes and to be alert. We were, but because you have to live the life, then you can't all the time be, it, uh, you know, scared, scared or, or, or that, that much careful, that much alert. So, yes. Much more careful, much more alert than, than in Israel or in a European country. But again, it does turn into a sort of routine. You have to, because you're living a sort of routine life. That's it. You're running a diving village. People come there. Tourists come there. You have to, you know, behave normally. So, uh, so yes, the answer is it's you're living a second life as a second person and uh, with a subconscious that's much more busy. With uh, with things that it's not busy with when you're at home. Yeah, so I mean, you know, in your opinion or, or not opinion, I mean, what, I guess there are some facts. But what are the mental attributes, personality traits, some key things? You know, you you have to be obviously very mentally very strong, very creative, uh, quick thinker, courageous, all these different things. Um, what exactly do you think the Mossad is looking for when they pick their agents? Or are there certain specific I've things? Never, I've never been in the recruiting part of the Mossad. I was always on the operational side, so I don't know. I was one of the the recruitees, not the recruiters. Yeah. So I don't really know. Uh, I do know because throughout the years, I did bring uh, people that I knew out of the Mossad, outside the Mossad. I brought them into the Mossad to join because I thought that they were uh, they were suitable. Yeah into my team and to other teams and to other operations, a lot of the Mossad recruiting is by friend brings friend. Really? Uh, if, you go to, if you go to the professional people in the Mossad, they will tell you probably that maybe uh, more, more that ended up good Mossad people were recruited that way than in the official way. But both types of people, those who come answer an ad in the paper, 
and those that come because a friend brought them go through the same uh the same you know uh tests and the same they go through the whole the say it's a big it's a big uh, it's a big machine yeah. the recruiting machine of the Mossad with lots of tests and checks and and whatever you whatever you and at the end they come up with uh, and also different types of jobs in the Mossad not all the jobs in the Mossad are the same yeah Mossad is a big operation you know it has ca- accountants it has logistic people it has technological people so for everyone for each of those jobs you're looking for different uh, different set of assets of uh, of attributes but uh, that's it and then for the ones at the uh, you know the end of the the top of the food chain there the the actual agents or the actual people doing a job in the field so for them i suppose the attributes or the prerequisites are higher or different than for people working in the technological department of the Mossad but if you want a formula from for me i don't know i wouldn't know i guess uh, things that uh, if you'd ask anyone in the street what you think would make a good spy and you'll come up with a list, you probably wouldn't be uh, far off the, the the correct list. So you were... I know it wasn't a very good answer. No, no, yeah. I know it wasn't exactly what I was looking for, but... Uh, it's okay. I, I wasn't even expecting you to answer. I just thought you'd said next question, so I'm, I'm happy you answered, so it's good. Um, you know, I, I know you were an active agent for years, and, you know, the Mossad, especially in, in, overseas, they have this image of a spy agency slash assassination unit that can reach anyone anywhere anytime do you think this image is is justified or is it just an image that they created kind of like a you know with with hollywood and with the news how much of it do you think is is justified and how much is i don't know blown out of proportion maybe i personally I think the Mossad in the last couple of years, this is my personal opinion, is to- talking itself to death. I think there's too much of it on TV, too much programs, too many programs in Israel TV where ex-Mossad people tell the story. Mm-hmm. I think it's a mistake. I think that the uh, the uniqueness and the uh, the force of a place like Mossad is in is in how much you don't know about it. The less you know, the better. The, anonymity. the less you know... The, best, the less you know, the image is better. The less you know, it's better for the Mossad as well. Uh, I can just say that uh, all the years I was there in this operation, and I w- this was my second tour of duty in the Mossad. I was there for six years before that on another, in another unit. And I can tell you that there was not one mission that was given to us which we didn't carry out successfully. That's That's all I can say, you know, but and the rest, people, you know, some things get to the press, and some things people make speculations about. So, I don't, don't, don't drag me there. I don't want to be there. Let's leave it. Are there other missions that you are able to talk about other than the Red Sea one? No. Um. So, as far as change, I mean, uh, when did you leave the Mossad? If, if I can ask. You want my life story in short? <laughs> <laughs> sure, man. No, the the reason I'm asking is because I want, you know, if, if if you see things being differently within, because I think maybe in the back in the day, it wasn't as technological where now everything is done, you know, via computers, chips, satellites. Um, you know, have, have you seen uh, a different type of advancement and a different type of operation style from, from uh, Mossad specifically and maybe... Uh, you know, other spying agents and, and agencies across the world? I'll, I'll, first of all, the two questions, that's two questions. First of all, a few words about myself, I'll do that afterwards. And secondly is, with all the technological technological breakthroughs and everything, at the end of the day, if there's no human inside the loop, then the intelligence agency or Mossad or whatever it turns out to be will screw up at the end of the day. Look at the great Osama bin Laden. United States intelligence had tons and tons of recorded uh, telephone calls, radio calls, tele radio, telephone, radio, wireless, whatever you want. Tons. It would take them a year and a half to decipher, to listen to everything. At the end of the day, they caught Bin Laden because of a human, because they understood that they need to they need to find a messenger, because there must be a messenger who goes for Bin Laden, 
and takes the video clips from him and takes them to uh, Al Jazeera radio or TV, whatever. So at the end of the day, no matter how sophisticated and how technological everything is, you want to really be a good, good intelligence agency, you need the human inside. Inside the enemy's network, you need the human in there. That's the way it works, and, that, and, it, will, and it will never be replaced, by the way. Never. That's an answer to what you said about technological and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And the United States, over the years, were leaning more and more on technology. And then they understood that had they not leaned that much on technology, uh, probably 9-11 wouldn't have happened if they would have managed to infiltrate someone into Osama bin Laden's network, which is the way to do it, not listen to telephone calls, but try and infiltrate someone into the organization, which is what they did eventually to catch him and to kill him. That's why they did it. They infiltrated his own close circle of people. So that's to answer your thing of uh, your issue of technology versus human versus uh, spies and whatever. At the end of the day, there's still no replacement for a good source, human source, close to your target. A few words about myself. I was born in Israel to a British mother. She's from Manchester. That ex- explains some of my English. And uh, an Israeli guy. Uh, she met him in, in England. He, was, uh, he fought in the British Army and he was taken prisoner by the Germans. And he was released to a place not far from Manchester. They married. She came with him to Palestine. It wasn't Israel yet. It was Palestine. They had one baby, this one. And then he went off and got killed in the War of Independence, 1948. So we moved back to England, and uh, we lived there for a few years. And then I came back and did my schooling in Israel with my and I spoke English at home all along. So I grew up completely bilingual. And uh, and that's it. I joined the military. I s- served in a special forces unit called Sayer Chaked, a desert, uh, desert fighting unit, like a ranger unit. When I demobbed, uh, uh, an El Al- airliner was hijacked to Algiers, and they put together a air marshal unit, and I was one of the first air marshals to fly, and I flew for about a year and a half with the airline, and then I was recruited to Mossad. I served there for six years as a as a field guy in some special unit, and then I left them. I had a little row. I resigned and I went back into the military and I joined the Air Force and I did the Air Force Academy. I became a fighter pilot in the Israeli Air Force. I flew for a few years. Then I had an accident. Uh, My engine blew up uh, after takeoff and the aircraft caught fire and I bailed out at about 100 feet and uh, miraculously lived to tell the story. I should have been, I I shouldn't have made it. Somehow I did. We spoke about luck before, so I was lucky again. And I uh, went into high tech for some time, did some high tech work, software, programming, whatever. And then Danny Limo, the first guy who ran the operation in Sudan, uh, called me. We meet, met in a cafe and he said, look, I'm doing this thing in Sudan. I want you to come and join and take over because I want to continue to other jobs. And I'm feeling that the noose is tightening around my neck in Sudan. So that was it. And uh, that's how I was recruited for the second time to the Mossad. So you weren't even. So I know everything you know about me. Yeah. So you weren't even an active agent at the time, right? When when they when you got recruited again. No, I was I was in the high tech industry. No, but I had six years of experience yeah. from my previous time. Yeah. I wasn't just taken off the street. Danny Limor approached me because he knew of my capabilities from. The previous time in Mossad, and why you know he knew me from that time. And, 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 and I mean, why would you want to go back? I mean, if you have a nice job, you're living a good life in Israel, and then all of a sudden to be thrown back into Sudan into danger, why, why, <laughs> it, why would you want to do that? It's it's a bug. It's a bug. They call me today. I'll go back again. Really? It's a bug that we have inside you. Uh, it's like uh, I don't know. I've never smoked, but probably like smoking. Or I've never been addicted to drugs, but it's probably like, it's a kind of addiction, I guess, in a way. Yep. Adrenaline addiction? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. I mean, after that, that was a crazy story you said. I mean, you kind of just flew right by it. But, I mean, being ejected from a burning plane is not something most people, you know, live to tell. 
did, did you kind of have a, uh, no, no. did you have a, you know, a coming to Jesus moment and yeah, minus Jesus, but did you have a, a introspective, maybe <laughs> like retro something where you're like, okay, maybe I have to analyze my life. I almost died right now. How did how did Jesus come into this thing? I don't know. That's a <laughs> it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a phrase. I've been in the U.S. too long. No, it's yeah. nice. Two, two nice, two nice Jewish people talking on the t- on the on the, this uh, interview, and suddenly Jesus comes. Up. <laughs> okay. He was Jewish too. No. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was to begin with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what you're right. Yeah. yeah. No, you know. Actually, after I bailed out of that aircraft, some people asked me why I don't go to synagogue. And pray, I'll go made, you know, thank yeah, you yeah. for saving me, whatever. My immediate reaction was on every other flight that I took, that I participated in, where my aircraft didn't blow up and I didn't bail out, was more of a reason to go and say thank you, because why this one when I almost died? Yeah. So, you know, someone tries to kill you, you go to thank someone for it? No. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> That's my take on things, I'm sorry. No, it makes complete sense. But, I mean... You- Take that aside, there was no kind of maybe moment of clarity, moment of, okay, maybe I need to do something different. Maybe I need to make some changes, something at all, or nothing? Are you just you know, on to the next chapter? No, just on, you know, he said, you know, it took me two, three seconds to decide in that coffee shop with Danny Limo, about two seconds to say, yes, that was it. Well, okay. Very short. But to tell you another story about what you asked before, Maybe not related, but somewhat related. I'm a lieutenant colonel in reserves today. Mm-hmm. I still, I'm still in active reserves, by the way, in the military, in the Air Force. Wow. And uh, a few years ago, we went to Poland as a military uh, group to visit the uh, concentration camps. You know, they do this from time to time. Yeah. And we went into Auschwitz, and uh, I lit a couple of candles. My wife... Uh, my wife's father lost his first wife and his first son in Auschwitz. They were cremated and, you know, killed and cremated, gassed and cremated. And uh, so I lit two candles for them, and I told the people in the group who I'm lighting this for. So one of them was a religious guy. Come and says, maybe you want to say Kaddish. I say, no. He said, but you have to say Kaddish. These people died. You know, I want to say, I said, no. And he started pressing me, and I told him, you know what, the last place on earth that makes me feel like saying Kaddish is here in Auschwitz. So leave me alone. So that's another way of answering your question from before. So are you, you're pretty much a <laughs> atheist is, is the right way to say it? No, I'm not an atheist. I'm a secular Jew. I'm uh, no, not atheist, but just not, not religious at all. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I'm, I'm I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not either. I'm a, you could say atheist. I mean, Judaism is a, it's a weird thing because even if you're not religious, if if you're secular, um, you still have there's some affinity. There's some part. It's part of the culture, right? You still do the the the, the holidays, and there's still something that's it's part of it's part of you, even though you're not a practicing one at all. So, yeah, it's a it's a, it's a weird. Start of you, and when you go into Sudan for six years and see these people and bring them to to Israel. It strengthens strengthens that part of you without necessarily touching the religious part, yeah, or the religious aspect of it. Yeah, I remember the videos of of, of the Ethiopians coming off the planes and you know and, and kissing the ground and just being just overwhelmed with joy. And I remember that little kid. There was this, there's a there's a video of this. <laughs> it's kind of funny because there's a video of this boy and he's beautifully you know playing this flute. And um, but everyone's kind of waiting to get off the plane, and there's media, and I think the president, the the prime minister, was there was was there at the time, and there's this guy next to this kid with the flute, and he's just telling the kid like, "Okay, kid, like, come on, <laughs> you're holding everyone up," and this kid just wants to play the flute, and it was just, I don't know it was a, it was a yeah. it was a funny video, but it was beautiful at the same time. Do you do you still work with the Ethiopian community in Israel? Very much, yeah. I'm. Uh, I think about sixty percent of my time is dedicated to the uh, Ethiopian community. I collect, pick up. You know, I recruit uh, Schno, as we say in uh, in Yiddish. I don't know any Yiddish. That's about the only word. Okay. But I get take money off all sorts of people who have money and uh, organize uh, scholarships for Ethiopian students who can't get hold of them or can't don't have enough money to pay for their tuition. I'm active in. Uh, 
three, four NGOs that deal with the Ethiopian community. And we ex a bunch of ex Mossad people are running a leadership uh, program for uh, for for mature Ethiopian guys who already have a bachelor's degree. Some of them have a master's degree. Mm-hmm. And uh, I lecture a lot on the operations, on the stuff that I did in Sudan. I lecture a lot, a lot of it as fundraisers, all sorts of Ethiopian causes. And I lecture a lot in the uh, military and in the Mossad and all sorts of other organizations, defense-related organizations, to tell them the story, to pass down the uh, legacy of what we did in, uh, in Sudan. So yes, I'm very busy. With, with Ethiopian community, very much. So that had a big effect on you, actually, what happened there. There was actually something that completely changed your life and, and your outlook. Yes, and we tried to kind of, you know, close the circle. We started in Sudan. The, this country, this country named Israel, uh, if you look at what happened in Sudan, it did stuff that, that probably no other country in the world would have done to bring these people back to the, to back home. And they did all the mistakes that they could have made in absorbing these people into the Israeli community and society. Yeah. So we felt obliged, me and some other guys felt obliged to try and uh, complete what we started in Sudan. So that dragged me into becoming uh, voluntarily and deeply involved with, uh, with the community. Yep. That's awesome. And, and are you still in touch with some of the people from... Um from the actual uh, mission, like Danny and, and some of the other people? Yes of, yes, of course, yes, yes. I am in touch with some of them, and I'm in touch with some of the Ethiopians who helped us inside the refugee camps, uh, still in touch with them, and uh, yes, I'm in touch with quite a few people. And some of the pilots who flew the, CH, CH, C1, the, H, the C-130s into Sudan, and some of the naval people, yes, we, we you know, different when this uh, Netflix movie, by the way, it wasn't Netflix. They just bought the distribution yeah. rights. It started off with nothing to do with Netflix. When they started uh, the movie and we had, had, I had them interviewing all these people. So it was a good, uh, good <laughs> chance of reunion with all of them again. So it was nice to get to meet them again. What did it, but the answer is yes. What did everyone That's think? Quite a few. S- sim- did everyone think kind of similar to you or that they didn't like the movie or did some people, or maybe some people did like the movie? A lot of people, people who don't know about the operation at all said the movie's okay. It's not a bad movie, you know, it's, uh, it's exciting, it has action in it, whatever. People who knew the operation, everyone, but everyone, without, uh, I mean, without any, all of them, said that the real life story was so much more exciting than the movie. Yeah. Why couldn't it just stick to facts? Why did they have to make up a story? So that was a general reaction. Anyway, yeah, they they always ruin it for some reason. They they over dramatize it and make it more uh, action packed, and you know they I don't know, yeah, they they tend to not stick to it. That's why I think nowadays shows are a little bit more popular because you can stretch out a story and and make it a little bit more personable. You can get you know, you know if, even the even the Ethiopian community were not happy about the movie because the movie. It starts off with these uh, Ethiopian soldiers going to a village and you see burned bodies yeah. and the village burning and stuff. So it conveys a message to the viewer that the Ethiopian Jews ran away from Ethiopia because of the situation in Ethiopia, which is not true. Mm-hmm. None of them left because of the situation in Ethiopia. They only left when they got the message through Feride that there is a chance to get to Jerusalem through, through Sudan. That's the only reason they did it. And the second thing they were pissed off about, uh, and justly so, was you see at the beginning of the movie, there are Mossad people helping their Jews walk through this river, walk through Ethiopia to Sudan, which is not true. They did it themselves. The Mossad was not involved at all. So there are a lot of inaccuracies in the movie, more inaccuracies and accuracies. The brave uh, lady in the village who assassinates or chokes or kills a Sudanese soldier, you know, it's a load of crap. Yeah. But, you know, why not? For the movie. Anyway. Anyway. There is one operation that was the most hair raising one that I was, took part in under my command. Okay. Yeah. If you, no, if you have a story, little, little stories. Little stories. I'll okay, tell you two stories. Sure, sure. Two sexist, two stories. One afternoon, we're sitting on the beach in, uh, in Arus, in the diving village, with our back to the sunset. For us, it's very strange because in Israel, the sun rises in the mountain and sets in the sea. Mm-hmm. And in Arus, it's the other way around. The sun rises in the sea and sets in the mountains because this is a, an east-facing beach yeah. 
as opposed to west-facing beaches in Israel. Anyway, we're sitting looking at the sea, and the sun is setting behind us, and I look around to watch the sun setting, and I see four people, or four silhouettes, walking towards me, heavy laden, with big stuff on the backs. I couldn't make out what they were, but I walk, got up and walked to them, and they are soldiers in full gear with weapons and huge rucksacks and fully, fully equipped soldiers. The face is painted black, but I could see straight away these are Caucasians. And I say, excuse me, but uh, who are you? What do you want with us? Or why are you here? So they said, uh, what is this place? I told them it's called Arus. It's a diving village. And they have a map with them. And they look at the map and said, we don't see this on our map. They speak perfect English. And I say, because your map is outdated. But this. So they say, uh, uh, and they whisper between themselves. They have a little discussion. And then they say, can we stay here a few minutes, a few days? So I said, with pleasure. What's your story? Who are you? I said, we're from the SAS. SAS, you know, the British Special Forces uh, Unit. We have an agreement with the Sudanese government. We do a survival uh, exercise in the desert. They drop us off with a Chinook helicopter. We're supposed to survive for three weeks. And after three weeks, we get picked up somewhere else. And our big packs on the back have food and drink. But we're supposed, uh, if we do it to get through with flying colors, we need to return to the helicopter three weeks later with everything intact. So we have to hunt, fish. Find water, whatever, okay? So that's the story. I said, okay. We gave, them a, we gave them two double rooms. They got up. They had breakfast in our dining room. They went diving with us in the morning, had lunch, went diving in the afternoon, that's did night thing. dives. Sometime at night, they would take out this special secret uh, communication gear, search an antenna, call the headquarters because they had to uh, call once a day to say that they're still surviving. And this is where they survived, in, in inverted commas, yeah. inv- survived for four days. And then they said goodbye, and they disappeared back into the desert. And we always wondered, you know, when they got back to the helicopter, when they were picked up, if they ever told the people about this uh, tough survival <laughs> part that they had in four days in a five-star hotel uh, diving village. That's hilarious. That's a funny story, and I've been trying ever since to try and find those guys and see if we can uh, get some sort of reunion with them. Yeah, that's so funny. I'm, uh, using, using, I'm using sources in the UK to try and do it for me. That's one story. The second story, which is about the operation proper, one night, the, the way this used to go is we used to leave Khartoum, the convoy of four vehicles. I would drive a, a clean, clean, I mean, with no Ethiopians inside, Jeep Land Cruiser, leading the convoy. There were two trucks behind me with a canvas on the, covered with canvas so people can't see what's inside, and another Jeep behind bringing up the rear in case someone gives us trouble from behind or tries to chase us, or whatever. We drive about 400 kilometers, about uh, 250 miles from Khartoum towards where the refugee camps are. There we meet, by a prefix sign or message, the Ethiopian helpers that worked for us inside the Ethiopian camps. And I would tell them they never had any advance notice because this was a routine meeting. We used to meet them every Friday. All our operations, by the way, were all on Friday because Friday is the uh, Sudanese... Saturday, so less police, less, you know, security forces are less alert. So, and we had a routine meeting with our helpers on Friday. So on this routine meeting, we told them, guys, I took them to this little uh, quarry, and I said, you have uh, two hours to get, bring us 400 people to this place. So this is the first note, first time they knew that there was an operation that same night. So they ran off into the refugee camps. We ran away to somewhere came back a couple of hours later, and they brought the Jews. And what happened was that they lost control. Because we did an operation just a week before that, they lost control, and the Jews were still excited in the refugee camps. And when when they understood that there was an operation the same night, somehow these people lost control. Instead of 400 Jews, they brought us about 900. And this is a big, big problem for us. First of all, we never, ever returned Jews from the pickup point back to refugee camp. It was very risky to take them back. So here we knew that we're going to return hundreds of them back because in my two trucks, I can only take probably maximum 200 per truck. The last operation, we took 190 per truck and there wasn't, you know, these are small trucks, nothing big. 190 people in a medium-sized truck, which is crazy, but that's what we did. We had a big problem and they started climbing onto the vehicles very shortly after that. They were packed, couldn't put in a matchstick. And I'm very annoyed with the... uh, 
my helpers why they brought so many people because now they have to take them all back to the village. But we tie, tie down the canvas and we wrap up everything and we start leaving. And as we're driving into the night, into the desert, I hear one of the drivers saying, I have a big, big problem. And when he said big, the way he said it, I know the guy, he's South African by origin. He never, ever raised his voice about anything. And I got the goosebumps and I drive back and I see that the whole side of his truck exploded, actually blew out because of the pressure from the people inside, because so many people were there. It did, couldn't hold it. And it pulled with it because it has like a crossbars on the top of the truck. It pulled out, pulled the second wall as well. And the whole back of the truck collapsed and all the people fell out and it was while it was moving. So we have injured and, and blood and, and shouts and terrible stuff. And it's the last thing we need because we're very close to the refugee camps and Sudanese security is crazy to know what's happening. And this is the last thing I, I need. And I look at this disaster and I say, how the hell do we get out of this thing? And the people that fell off the truck, they look at the the other truck, which is undamaged at the time. They started climbing from the outside on the canvas. They thought they could get in through the top, but the canvas goes all the way across the top as well. So there's nowhere for them to go into. And we start pulling them off, off the truck. I send one of my guys back to the pickup point, hoping that the, my helpers will still be there near runs back and he brings one of the helpers and say, all these people, all these wounded people, everyone, take them back to the refugee camps. There's nothing we can do with them. And what happened was the canvas on the truck got tangled in the rear two wheels and created a whole big, uh, it was a big mess. Yeah. And they took these, all the wounded people back to the refugee camps and we took, we had these commando knives. We started cutting the canvases to release the truck from its own uh, predicament and we threw everything on the back of the truck. It didn't look, didn't look like a truck anymore. There was a cab the platform at the back with pieces of metal, wood, and canvas tied up in a big bundle. And meanwhile, the other truck, I sent them off to drive to the main road and to drive north, and I told them, we'll catch up with you later, which we did eventually. And it was hardly moving the truck, and we could see by the way the, the walls at the back, the sides of the truck were bloated. It looked like it was going to blow any moment now, just like the other one did. And I was hope, praying that it wouldn't happen on the main road because there's no way in the world we could have come out of that alive. Yeah. Eventually, we go, we're driving to the desert, to the place where we decide to land the Hercules aircraft. And I had a standing order from my superiors and from the Air Force that if I have less than 250 Jews with me, I give permission. I land only one of the C-130s because we knew that uh, every C-130 landing in the desert is a risk. And if we can fit 250 into one of them, so we don't land both of them. And I look at this truck and I say, the previous operation, we had 190 people in it. It wasn't placed for a match team. So how many are there now? 200, 210? I decided to land two aircraft. We don't count. We can't count the people at night. We distribute them between the two aircraft. The aircraft goes home. We drive into the desert, go to sleep. The following morning, we start driving. And I see that the two back wheels of the truck that didn't fall apart, kind of wobbly and say to the drivers, stop a minute. You know, we have uh, bolts that hold the wheel in place. Mm -hmm. On a truck, there are about 12 of them or 10. There was only one left. <laughs> and not that the bolts but became unscrewed, but the because of the weight on the truck, the screws actually broke. So from some time in the operation, we will never know from when, this truck was running with the two rear right-hand wheels connected by one screw and one bolt. That was it. Wow. And uh, the following day, I get a message from home through my special secret radio channel that uh, we brought back 314 Jews. So in a truck that with 190 Jews, you think you couldn't fit a matchstick, there were 314 Jews inside there. Unbelievable. And uh, over the years, I've met quite a few of them. Actually, they called me some time ago. You asked about my connection with the Ethiopian community. So all the people who came on that operation, they have a WhatsApp group mm -hmm. and they're still in contact with each other. And now they call me, they want to have a reunion when we get, when we get rid of this corona stuff. Yeah. They want to have a reunion, all the people that came out of that truck and the one that fell apart. And they want to have a reunion and they want me to tell the story of the way I saw it and they to tell their story. So that was an incredible night and one we thought would be... Uh, would be the end of us in Sudan. But somehow we came out of that one alive as well. So there you are. I told you, luck luck had a big part in our operation. Yeah, I feel like luck is always a big part in, in everything. 
like you said, almost double the amount of people on a truck with two wheels, each of them hanging by by one bolt. <laughs> if that's not luck, I mean, I don't know what is. Actually, they tried to persuade you not to take that truck to the operation because the driver said it's not in about in good condition. And it's kind of the run engine isn't running that smooth. Let's not take it. Let's take another one. But we, it's not like Avis, you know, till we find a truck yeah. that's usable. <laughs> can't go to a rental car and say, change my car. There were no rental companies in the country at the time. Yeah. So I told them, guys, look, the truck has a nishuma, a nishama. It has its soul. Oh. You won't give in on us. It will It will take us through. It did, a, it did a service in five previous operations. It will go through this one as well. And when the truck fell apart, it was the other one. It was the good one that fell apart. And this bad one was the one who completed the operation. I told him, you see, I told you. It wouldn't let us down. There you are. So, you know. <laughs> I heard um, Danny Limo. He was speaking about how he would never, once he would leave the car, so let's say he, if there were roadblocks and he would leave the roadblock and to go to talk to the guard, he would always keep the engine of the car on because when he needed to run back in and drive, if the car was off, he didn't, it's 50-50 if the engine goes. So he would always keep the engine going mm-hmm. when he was out of the car. The whole of Sudan is 50-50. Nothing works in that country, <laughs> or at the time. I always called it a mistake, not a country. It's a big mistake. Yeah. Well, now it's two countries, I guess. Yeah, there you are. Do you have any any uh, plans maybe to do a, a memoir or a book or something in the future? People have been chasing me for all over the years to do it because I lecture a lot and they say, you must, must write a book. I haven't done so far, but uh, maybe one day. I don't know. Actually, the corona thing was a good time to do it, but I'm... I never got started, so I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Maybe one day. Maybe one day. And uh, I mean, like you said, you have 11 years of stories or six years of stories particular to there, but we can always do it again. I'd be happy to have you on and and talk some more. So maybe we'll do it in the future. Felix, I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really enjoyed it. You know, it's someone, it's something that I wanted to talk to for a while and I wanted to talk to you. So thank you so much, man.